California, eh? What a place. Its glossy commercials promote a dreamy, carefree Hollywood lifestyle of constant sunshine and good, healthy outdoor living. It's the fifth largest economy in the world, ahead of the UK and Germany, and it's by far the most populous state in America, with almost 40 million citizens. But California also faces huge challenges with its climate and environment. The globally televised annual wildfires appear to be getting more extreme, air pollution levels in the big cities are among the worst in the country, if not the world, and the water crisis shows no sign of easing up anytime soon. So perhaps it's not surprising that California also leads the way in the search for revolutionary, renewable and sustainable ways to manage its land and energy needs as we move deeper into the 21st century. And now that challenge has been analysed, quantified and clarified by a very large team of researchers coordinated by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. In this groundbreaking report published in January 2020, the team sets out the roadmap for California to reach carbon neutrality by 2045 or sooner. And their conclusion is that the only way the state will get there is by embracing extremely ambitious measures to achieve the elusive goal of negative emission pathways. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. For quite some time now, California has been leading the way by reducing the carbon footprint of its electricity supply, putting cleaner cars on its road and reducing emissions from transportation fuels. But they still face huge challenges in rapidly decarbonising towards their target of neutrality by 2045. So this new 190 page report contains some pretty radical proposals. It says to reach its ambitious goal of economy-wide carbon neutrality by 2045, California will likely have to remove on the order of 125 million tonnes per year of CO2 from the atmosphere. The report maintains that California can achieve those negative emissions at what it describes as modest cost using resources and jobs within the state and with technology that's already demonstrated or mature. So how exactly are they proposing to achieve this lofty goal? Well, the report sets out three fundamental pillars of activity to reach the target. The first pillar is land management. The second is waste biomass. And the third is direct air carbon capture and storage. Each of these three areas has a different potential carbon dioxide reduction benefit and a different set of costs that will be incurred in setup and implementation. To keep the report standardised and to try to compare apples with apples, the team assessed each area based on the projected amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that would be removed from the atmosphere and the allocated costs per tonne of CO2 removal for each method proposed. Land management offers great potential in California. More than 90% of the state is covered by natural and working lands. Forests are one of the most beautiful and best known natural assets of the state and they offer the biggest opportunity for achieving negative carbon emissions from natural resources. The researchers looked at two main methods to get there. Firstly, through changes to the management of the existing forest by increasing harvest rotation length, maintaining stocks at a high level and increasing productivity by removing diseased or suppressed trees. Negative emissions are based on the ongoing capture and storage of carbon, mostly by the simple practice of turning trees into wood products that will go into more or less permanent long-term service. So that includes larger timbers for the construction industry and smaller timbers for things like furniture. The report suggests that these improved management practices could remove up to 15.5 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent from the atmosphere every year. The second strategy is reforestation and active regeneration of forests on sites that experienced a significant disturbance from wildfire. Once again, negative emissions can be achieved here by the ongoing sequestration of carbon. By engaging in this one very simple activity, the report says it can remove another 4.9 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. But California is not simply one big forest, it also boasts huge areas of wetland and grassland and there's a great deal that can be done to better manage these areas as well. Restoring managed freshwater and tidal wetlands from peatland sites previously converted for the cultivation of corn or for use as irrigated pasture will result in negative emissions as those wetlands sequester carbon and a similar negative emission result will be achieved by restoring grasslands that have previously been commandeered for yet more crop cultivation. According to the report, those changes alone could result in 1.2 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent every year. Then we come to possibly the most misunderstood, misused and misappropriated natural resource that we've got available to us, and that's the soil itself. Since the advent of modern humans, our planet's soils have lost about 130 billion tonnes of organic carbon to the atmosphere. And that's about 477 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent. We looked at how that happens in great detail last year in our two-part programme on regenerative agriculture and you can click up there somewhere to look at those two. 
Reversing these losses of organic carbon from the soil by altering land management practice and techniques would not only draw down and lock away atmospheric CO2, but it would also deliver very noticeable improvements in soil fertility, says the report. If these improvements were achieved all over the world, it would result in the drawdown and storage of between 3.7 and 14.7 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. You take that against the 37 billion tonnes of CO2 we currently pump out into the atmosphere, and it's not difficult to see that this level of sequestration would have the potential to quite significantly offset the global temperature increases that we're currently experiencing. The final string to the bow of natural resource management is something called biochar. Biochar is a condensed aromatic carbon rich substance that can be produced at a large scale from biomass pyrolysis technology. It's a pretty incredible material with a multitude of uses. In the context of this report, the researchers propose using biochar as an energy product and as a soil amendment. It can be burnt to provide heat for large industrial plants, most significantly in cement production. 40% of the 2 billion tonnes of CO2 spewed out globally each year by the cement industry comes from the burning of fossil fuels. Biochar can greatly reduce this number. The team also investigated the advantages of adding biochar directly into soil. It's been shown to increase carbon content, improve water retention, reduce nutrient leaching, and improve the sponginess of the soil itself. It's a complex interaction of soil, biochar, weather, and agricultural management. So the report's authors suggest that more research is necessary to demonstrate long-term benefits. But for the purposes of the report, they assume that 80% of biochar carbon can be stored underground for more than 100 years. That gives us a grand total of 25.5 million tonnes of negative CO2 equivalent emissions every year from the first pillar of the proposal at a cost of about $11.4 per tonne. Next up is waste biomass. Waste biomass is widely available across California. It's stuff like agricultural stubble residue that tends to get left on top of the harvested ground and residues from industries producing wines, beers and crop fuels, all of which have residues that can be easily collected and used as waste biomass. You can also get biomass from the biogenic bits of trash that go to municipal waste facilities. And then you've got the gaseous waste, like the delightful stuff that comes out of sewage digesters, and forest waste from logging and fire prevention activities. Landfills are a huge generator of methane and CO2 as microbes digest the organic matter contained within them. Anaerobic digesters also create biogas from food waste, municipal wastewater and dairy manure. Landfill gas accounts for about 20% of California's total methane emissions. The state already has a target to reduce food waste in landfills by 75%. And the report recommends that this waste should be diverted to the existing anaerobic digesters at wastewater treatment plants. California generates about a trillion gallons of wastewater every year, about 90% of which is processed by anaerobic digestion, producing biogas and some biosolids. Most of the biogas is currently used for electricity generation, but today there's no facility for capturing the CO2 produced by burning the gas. The report says both biogas and biosolids could be used to achieve negative emissions if the CO2 was captured and sequestered. And because the collection of biogases and biosolids is already routine practice as part of wastewater management, there'll be no significant cost of production of biogas or biosolids from wastewater other than upgrading the biogas so that it can be injected straight into the existing pipelines and other pathways that can yield negative emissions. Almost 5% of California's greenhouse gas emissions come from manure and other livestock emanations. 60% of the 1,331 Californian dairies currently store manure in lagoons, which is not good. But these lagoons can be inexpensively upgraded and covered so that they also become great big anaerobic digesters, which would allow cow manure to be harvested as biogas. The methane produced could be used for energy and the CO2 combustion gas would be captured and stored. Forest biomass in the form of sawmill residue is a clearly available source of biomass fuel, but perhaps less obvious is the thinning out of shrubland and woodland. In response to the growing wildfire problem in the state, CAL FIRE and the United States Forest Service have begun implementing a variety of fire prevention treatments, including thinning and controlled burns on a million acres of land annually to reduce the likelihood and severity of wildfires. A lot of that forest biomass can be used in negative emissions pathways, and mechanical thinning could enable profitable management of up to 800,000 acres per year. Based on their full analysis, the research team estimate there's about 24 million tonnes of biomass available from forest management every year. 
Still more is available from the wine and beer industries and from the fermentation process used to get energy from crops like corn and switchgrass. Then we come to the most expensive of all the carbon sequestration methods and arguably the most contentious, and that's direct air capture. We've looked at this technology a couple of times on this channel, most recently in the program that you can jump back to by clicking up there. So we won't delve deeply into it again here. Essentially though, the report focused on the technology being developed by a company called Carbon Engineering up in Squamish in British Columbia. They looked at various ways to provide the energy required to run the capture process, including natural gas with capture of combustion CO2, wind power, solar power and geothermal industrial waste heat. The net result, based on realistic data and future assumptions by the research team, was that direct air capture could permanently store at least 16 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. So where exactly will all that captured carbon actually be permanently stored? Well, in addition to the obvious stuff that's stored in plants and soils through the natural solutions we looked at earlier, the aim would be to pump CO2 gas thousands of feet underground into porous rock, just like the rock that makes up California's oil and gas fields. At depths below 3,000 feet, CO2 converts to a liquid-like form that has about the same density and viscosity as oil. The fact that these rocks already hold oil and gas clearly proves that they have the ability to trap fluids underground over millions of years. The report says California's deep sedimentary rock formations in the Central Valley represent world-class CO2 storage sites that would meet the highest standards with storage capacities of at least 17 billion tonnes of CO2, which is many decades worth of capacity to store carbon from the negative emissions pathways proposed by the research team. Storage of CO2 and the pipelines and transport mechanisms to get the gas to the storage sites themselves will be a crucial element of the negative emissions challenge. While these steps are comparatively inexpensive, says the report, at between $10 and $20 per tonne, they will likely be the most time consuming as developers overcome the numerous logistical and regulatory hurdles involved. And they'll certainly require a concerted effort from farmers, landowners, waste handlers and state agencies. But the researchers say the prize is well worth striving for. Taking all these emission reductions initiatives together gets California easily to its target of 125 million tonnes of CO2 per year from the atmosphere by 2045. And direct air capture can be ramped up way more if necessary. The cheapest scenario outlined in the report comes with a price tag of about $8 billion per year or $65 per tonne of CO2. And that's about 0.34% of California's current gross domestic product, which seems extremely reasonable given the obvious benefits. The report concludes with this statement. The opportunity to act is unique. California is ideally situated to lead in this task with a long history of aggressive policies for efficiency, renewable energy and carbon reduction, along with geology and a workforce ideally suited to this task. The stage is set, says the report. The actions needed today to help California be carbon neutral and ultimately carbon negative are available and affordable. And this plan doesn't need to wait for 2045. Progress can begin immediately and the carbon reductions we envision can be achieved much sooner, accelerating a truly carbon neutral economy for California with a carbon negative economy in sight. That's it for this week. Just time to give a quick shout out to the folks who since our last programme have joined our Patreon team with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Mike Witherspoon, Bjorn Johnson, Chris Paradox, Lita Thomas and Merrick Gogri. A massive thank you to those folks and to all the channel supporters over at Patreon who continue to demonstrate incredible generosity despite the extraordinarily uncertain times we're living through right now. If you'd like to get more involved with the channel and have your say in monthly content polls, then you can do that by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can show your support for the channel for free by hitting the like button and by subscribing, both of which massively help to get our message to more and more people each week. It's dead easy to subscribe. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notified about new content. As always, thanks very much for watching. I hope you're continuing to stay safe and healthy during the global lockdown and not going too stir crazy. Have a good week if you can. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.